about the local area. So I tried to sort of connect with the archivist and there were some resources in the department. And what I've slowly been doing is building, building um, some local history pieces. And I try to use those to engage students um, right at the beginning of a course, just to recognize that this isn't something that's abstract and sort of out there. Um, so two examples that I use locally in my own classroom on the left is uh, Helen Kinnear. Um, has anyone heard of Helen Kinnear or aware of her contributions? So you can see there, like she had a stamp named after her and with her picture on it. And um, uh, the local archive and museum, uh, they actually did a, a heritage minute project uh, down in Haldeman County. And I learned about Helen Kinnear when I first started teaching law. And she's an impressive lady. Uh, she actually it was the first uh, woman to argue a case before both the Supreme Court of Ontario and the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, she was also the first woman in the British Empire to become a King's Counsel in 1943. And she's also the first federally appointed female judge in Canada. And the first time that she was actually, um, you know, made as a, as a counsel, King's Counsel, was actually in the Cayuga Courthouse, which is still standing. It's still the original building. Uh, and they still hear trials. So uh, I actually get to take, you know, some of my students down there. So I always like to connect uh, the kids to individuals. And uh, one of my passions is also the First World War as some of you know. Uh, and on the right, there is um, a picture of some soldiers there, some officers. Um, the guy at the bottom left is, uh, at that time, Lieutenant Oliver Martin. Um, he actually became the highest ranking um, uh, Aboriginal soldier in Canadian history. He was from Six Nations. Um, he actually attended a, a normal school, ended up being a teacher at a lot of the day schools, uh, which is not part of the residential school system, and then actually became a principal of a high school in Toronto in the interwar period. Um, he um, he's actually became a, a, an a Indigenous rights activist as well, and he actually said, I try to teach Aboriginal people about the rest of the country, and I try to educate the people of this country about Aboriginal people, and I am in a happy position of knowing both sides. So I always like to use that as a piece of like the reconciliation within my class because we are on the, um, on that six uh, mile either side of the Grand River so that's some context as well so whenever I start my classes I just try to sort of give them a local a local taste of the history so that we can uh, we can start from there and sometimes it gives them a little bit of community pride um, because sometimes kids who are from a small town they don't see it as very useful or valuable or they don't think there's anything good that comes out of their small towns and then when you start to sort of piece those um, parts together it becomes really valuable for them and they start to recognize these places that they go by every day and then they sort of connect to it a little bit it doesn't work all the time but we do make connections with the kids and basically the whole idea is that the community is your classroom and that you you can go beyond those classrooms as well um, so where does it fit in the curriculum? Um, this is my uh, curriculum nerd hat coming on right now. I'll go very quickly over this. Many of you are familiar with the front matter of our curriculum documents. So the Canadian World Studies, we have this citizenship education framework. And the very top right is really where you get that local history uh, flavor. Um, they have a sense of connectedness to local, national, and global communities. Like in order to feel like they're part of a community, they have to recognize aspects of it. Um, um, consider and respect others' perspectives, develop a sense of civic self-image, and all of this you can um, do through uh, connecting kids with local history. Also, there are so many community partners. Canada is really starting to pick up on this concept of heritage. Um, the, the States does it quite well. It, I've been to some historical societies in the States, and then in Britain, there's a massive amount of heritage organizations. But locally, a lot of community partners are, are becoming excellent partners and those can include pu uh, public libraries, uh, local museums, heritage associations and because of this whole online thing that they've really started to bolster a lot of their online content and it actually says in the curriculum that we're supposed to um, work with local librarians, historians, curators um, and this is our opportunity to do that. Also in using local history we're definitely meeting uh, strand A of the Canadian World Studies Historical inquiry expectations and because all this is online kids are actually learning how to use databases properly as opposed to 
um, doing a cold Google search um, and computer use and using databases becomes uh, something that they actually become quite good at uh, using these databases. Um, so that's like sort of the rationale behind why local history is good to use and it's not an add on and it can be infused right into the curriculum. So there's three courses that I'm going to touch on specifically. And I wanna identify the fact that some people's comfort levels are very different. So it's kind of like social media when uh, you're first starting to use social media, sometimes you just start with one platform and you play with it for a bit. The same thing with local history. Maybe there's one lesson that you really wanna drive home with some local history. For me to start, that was in the, uh, using the First World War information that I was coming across through my um, association uh, with the Great Wars and Association. So I've been using a lot of local history within that context. But now as I'm teaching that, you know, grade 10 and the other courses longer, I'm now finding little parts. And every time I teach the course, I add a little bit more into it. It's not like you have to overhaul your entire course or your binder. It's just a matter of just just here's one lesson that we can try it out and see if it works and, and try again. Um, also, two uh, local partners are very willing to work with teachers to help develop those um, curriculum expectations as long as you tell them what they are, because again, the, the local partners are not curriculum experts, we are, so that it, we just need to communicate that with them. So the three courses I'm going to use is one that many of us are all familiar with and have been tasked with, uh, which is the 2P2D Canadian History, which is the grade 10 applied and academic. Um, there's also the civics and citizenship, which again, every student has to take. And then I wanted to really focus on this really amazing course that we have in Ontario, which I'm not really sure how widely it's, it's, it's being utilized, but because of the nature of our communities, which are uh, heavily populated with different immigrant groups, we have this CHE 3 uh, 3.0 Origins and Citizenship course, which is a grade 11 open course. It is an excellent uh, way to sort of infuse local history. It's, it's ideally suited towards local history, actually. Um, is anybody in the group here familiar with that course or have they taught it? Um, or have they, are they thinking about teaching it or is it offered in their schools? So I'm not seeing a lot of, okay. All right. Um, okay, so first off, 2P, I'm going to start with a story that I use with my 2Ps, um, 2P history, the applied history. The topic uh, that we all cover at the beginning is the First World War. I actually teach it as a part of a second unit. I kind of start in 1982 and go forward for the first unit and with Afghanistan and then I go right back to World War I. Um, but when I teach World War I, um, it's really easy to go and talk about like the big battles, which people love or hate. Um, but really what's interesting for a lot of the kids is these personal stories. So because of the centenary of the First World War, which ended in 2018, we now have a lot of information. For example, the First World War personnel files have all been digitized. But locally, there are a lot of organizations who have taken on the task of researching uh, local contributions in their own communities to what was happening in the First World War. Um, and this is where I got hooked, right? Um, so the the over so the uh, specific expectation is describe the impact that World War One had on Canadian society and the politics and politics and the lives of different people in in Canada. So because I lived in Brantford at the time, I was teaching at BCI, um, and because of my um, association with this group, the GWCA, they created a database uh, where you could investigate the lives of over 5,000 soldiers and nursing sisters who participated in the First World War. And over a series of, of years and, and lots of uh, research and digi digitization, there has been created a database full of profiles where these profiles have all of the enlistment information for each person. And then we were able to source a lot of photos graphs about these individuals. So instead of having names on a cenotaph, which we all see, we can now attach a name to it. And the one that I love to use is this guy right here. This is Samuel Chikajian. He was born in Armenia and uh, he actually enlisted at the age of 14. So again, we're getting close to the age of those students in your grade 10 class. This kid is really interesting um, because he actually um, 
He was born in Armenia, came over with his parents. He actually died in the war uh, during the last 100 days. And um, he, and it's funny because the street that he lives at, which is uh, Alfred Street, you can still walk by the house, it's still there. Um, but he was actually 14 when he enlisted. He, he sort of tricked his, his way into enlisting. He really very desperately wanted to enlist. Um, he was actually able to go in and enlist and then his mother found out. <laughs> And she tried, and she tried to get him out of the war, and she did. And then he re-enlisted again. Um, and the whole backstory to him is actually on on the website. So I'm just going to very quickly um, just go and show you what his profile looks like. So with the database that we have locally, um, we have this uh, website called Doing Our Bit. So I'm just going to use this as my own personal example, and then I'm going to get into the other things. So what's interesting about this database is that it's it uses predictive search. So if you have a name or an address or a birth country or a cemetery, all you do is type in the first few letters and then you'll see all the names that pop up. So I'm going to search him and then uh, it will display. There he is right there. We're not seeing so it. What's really, oh, we're, we're still seeing. There? No, you're on. We're on your, your slide still. OK. Wait for it. There we are. Sorry. Thank you. Is it there now? No, it's oh, there it is now. Okay. Yeah, there's a bit of a lag, I think. Sorry. Yeah. So I'll just go back and I'll show you the predictive search. So uh, what I did is I put in the first couple of letters of his name and Chikajian. Now you can do this with anything. You can do last name, you can do address, uh, birth city. If you want to do like a roll call of a, of a specific street, you could do that. So there is his uh, profile right there. And what's interesting about him is we uh, compiled a lot of information. So there's his attestation information. He was a soda dispenser. We have to explain what that is to kids, funny. There's a gallery, there, he's on our Anglican church memorial plaque, et cetera. But if we look at the um, letters home, the reason why he wanted to enlist had a lot to do with the Armenian genocide. So this brings in something that we, we often ex don't even talk about uh, when we teach Canadian history is that there was a genocide happening at the same time that, that the First World War was happening. And as he came over as an Armenian, you can see this letter where his mom is just freaking out about him leaving and why did you leave and I can't believe that whatever and he writes his mother and and you can see here at the at the bottom we'll just uh, he's he's very sort of flip about everything because he's 14 um, and it says here at the bottom the French people are very kind and we're often invited to some farm um, and leave with a couple of chickens we have nothing to kick about I'm in the best of health the officer called me up and asked me about the letter you wrote him he asked me if I wanted to go back but I said no I I know you must be worried mother but there is no use trying to get me to quit when I've come so far. I'm going to try and do my share. Think of the relations the Turks have killed in this war. I mean to have a few. Germans and Turks are about the same. One is worse than the other. So then now you can explore the whole like concept of the immigrant experience as a soldier coming over as well. Um, and that sort of starts a really interesting conversation. So sometimes what I'll do with my students is I will actually do an activity where I'm just trying to, there we are. We'll do an activity where in fact they do individual profiles because now all those sources have been digitized so they can go on and they can they can look those up. So that's my that's my local kick, like that's how I got into it. But I realized that not everybody has has this database available to them. So then when I moved uh, schools and I ended up in Haldeman County, um, they have quite a rich database of information, but it's not organized quite the same way. And as I started investigating more of their online resources, I realized that they were actually using a portal called Our Ontario. Um, and Our Ontario is a really excellent resource and I'll show you very shortly how to navigate it and then I'll take you through those, those other courses. So basically Our Ontario is a massive database that allows for all of these um, 
organizations, libraries, museums, any any group that has any kind of digitized material to, to add it to this massive database across Ontario. So here are some examples. Um, so the Greater Sudbury Historical Database. And Vanessa, I put that there and for specifically for you because we were talking about you know the lack of that. <laughs> um, and also St. Mary's has their own portal through our, our Ontario called Picture St. Mary's, which is just all digitized images. Um, there's also West Nipissing. So a lot of these very remote communities where people are quite separated or if there's transportation is an issue as well, um, they've actually digitized a lot of their information and put it available through this database. For those people teaching civics or wanting to do that, um, I went through and looked at the resources available through the Greater Madawaska Public Library. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because if you look at this article here, it talks about uh, how all these candidates showed up at this one person's house um, to sort of canvas. It was, it was really quite frustrating for them. Also, efforts are being made to have the bylaw forbidding the running at large of cattle repealed. <laughs> so again, for those kids who are local to that area, that might have some resonance for them. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just show you how to navigate that website because everybody across Ontario will be able to have access to that. So I'm just going to go up and go there right now. Do, do, do. And okay. So you should be able to see um, the Our Ontario. So it's just ourontario.ca. And as you can see here, uh, 2.3 million items and there are our um, organizations, libraries, museums who have basically downloaded all of their digital content into this one database, which is incredible as a teacher where you're trying to find that local history content. Um, the best way for you to find information that's specific to your community is actually to click on this browse by contributor. So if you click on that icon right there, it shows you all of the groups and organizations who have contributed digital archives to this database. And there are thousands and thousands of, of articles, uh, images, etc. And pretty much every area of Ontario is covered. So and, and it actually shows in brackets how many images or, or, or pieces of data that they've, they've, they've submitted, right? So you have it all the way from uh, at the top, you have the, the 1812 history project. And then at the very, very bottom, it goes right down to uh, York University. Um, and so that's interesting as well, because I'm going to be using some of their stuff later. So even as a, someone who's living in an area, uh, so when I when I first moved to Brantford, I didn't know the local history. I'm from out of town. Um, so if I was a teacher who was in a school where I wasn't from that area and I didn't really know a lot about the local area, uh, you could sort of cold search all of the you know historical associations in your area. Um, but because of the shutdown, this is actually a really good tool because you can click on any of these links and you can go in and look at what they have to offer. Um, so for example, I'm just gonna use one randomly, um, the Thessalon Union Public Library, right? So here, what you can see, and I've just searched using the contributors, is they've actually, you're able to uh, narrow your search on the right hand side, media type, also location, right? So if you were to investigate, you know, Bruce Mines or Iron Bridge or Mississauga River, it's all there, plus um, groups that have contributed information to this uh, are all listed there. And also you can even reduce it down to which year. So any of the years that pop up where you have, for example, a specific date, 1904, you would click on that and then it would take you to that specific um, uh, document. So here's the Thessalon men's hockey team in 1904 um, and you can see that. So if you click on the uh, actual article or the item, it's really interesting because it's like a 2.0 platform where you can actually provide like and, and whoever posts this, so whichever organization has posted it, sometimes they'll have a question that they'll put at the top like, do you know anything about these people in this photograph? And then the public can actually make comments 
on the actual article as well so that there's some interaction there and two you can create an electronic postcard which sometimes work and sometimes doesn't so then you can actually send this document to somebody else and you know ask them questions or whatever so we'll just go back and take a look at some of the metadata that's there. It tells you what image type it is, tells you just like a very brief description, it tells you who those people, the date is there, and it also tells you who contributed it, if it's in, in fact um, able to be shared or used publicly, and then it will show you uh, geographically where it is as well, which is good for our geographic you know, understanding of the world. So then you can also see at the top that there's actually this whole portal that goes into this section that just deals with these three small communities where because of their rural um, because of the rural position in the in the province this actually provides students from those areas a little bit more access hoping of course that they have good internet which i have no control over um, so that's one way that you can search so i'm just going to go back and, and share my and share my screen again um, Share screen here. So that's that's sort of a, a way for me to show like all of these different communities are contributing and they all overlap as well. Um, and then you can actually search within the database. So it seems a little overwhelming for some people, um, but in fact, if you kind of know what you're looking for, or if you take an afternoon, you know, during the summer, which maybe you want to be at the cottage or whatever. Uh, you can actually take an opportunity just to explore some of this or if you have a specific topic that you want to address um, then you can go in there and do that so um here's one for grade 10 applied history then and so a lot of the expectations around residential schools we've seen this image in the middle which is thomas moore uh, it's that very famous image it's actually on those historical thinking concept posters um, and you can see like the before and after because of the residential school experience but what I came across when I was looking up uh, residential schools within the our Ontario database, because this image about Thomas More is actually from Regina, is this image right here of this young boy. I mean, look how similar the two pictures are, but they're from two very, very different locations. So this image here is of a young boy who uh, was actually at a residential school in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, and I used our Ontario to find this. And I also thought because this particular photograph predates 1914, it is interesting to talk about continuity and change. We can use stuff from before 1914 and talk about, you know, what's the consequence of residential school systems, you know, afterwards. So sometimes with students, like it's just like a visual history. It's a visual representation of something, but to show them that this was like some kind of pattern is interesting so what i would do for them is i would model for them you know here's your keyword here's the media type and then you can break it down to geographic location so what i've done is i've provided like the search result and i've just underlined and bolded my my search like my my um search criteria so um that's what i would do and i can just model that for you in a few moments but i'm just going to move forward so what I like to do with my um, grade 10s is specifically a lot of them are very concerned about whether or not they're going to be able to answer questions. They're always worried if they don't know the right answer. And one thing I like to actually um, do with my students is have them start asking questions. It goes back to the whole uh, inquiry um, um, strand in the curriculum. And their first activity when we deal with primary source documents and primary source evidence is instead of answering a question, why don't we start asking some questions? So my first activity, and I've actually provided it to Vanessa as a, as a PDF file, it can be adopted um, is this image that we see right here um, so we have uh, this image and I have the I have the link there so I'm just going to pop out of this screen for a second and show you I've placed the link in the uh, chat box okay perfect okay so this um, this, this is a very, very generic uh, activity and it just gets kids to start thinking. They get really freaked out when you ask them questions and they don't know the answer and then they just kind of shut down. But this actually I find is really good for students because instead of being responsible for um, asking the questions, 
answering the question, they're responsible now for asking the question. And I say to them, you don't need to know the answer, right? You don't need to know what the answer is to these questions. You just need to be able to know how to ask the right questions because in asking questions, you actually get to start investigating topics. So then we go over the four types of questions that we do in history. And, I, and we do this little activity that you can see on the screen here. We would talk about factual questions, causal questions, comparative and speculative questions. What I would do with them is model this with them. Um, and I would use uh, that picture. And then I would give them this page right here. So I give them that image, um, which we actually, um, I just showed you there. And then I had the kids go through and ask the questions. And they said, well, do I have to answer them? I said, no, you just have to ask the questions. And then I would give them feedback as to whether or not they were good questions based on the fact that can we do further research beyond the question that you're asking. So the whole idea is, is that they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be um, constrained by the fact that they don't know the answers. And that's the whole point is that as historians, we don't know all the answers and that we would like to find out the answers and we might not get the answers, but we might find something else as well. And that's kind of part of the historical thinking process, right? Is that we have this piece of evidence and where does it lead us to? So um, that's how I like to do that. And so that's why I've shared that document because you can modify and use that document for pretty much any, um, any of those um, Canadian based history courses. Um, so that would be like your takeaway is you just even having an image locally um, and you and this is the thing too that I love is I don't know anything with this picture, but I would still use it as a teacher in my classroom. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point isn't me knowing exactly what the context of this picture is the whole point is me encouraging them to think about how do I find out more what are some things we might want to know about. And it's kind of like that um, uh, visual thinking where you're looking at something, you give them about 30 seconds, and then you each you ask each of the students, tell me one thing you notice. So uh, Rachel talked about the swag at the back. That's <laughs> something I hadn't even noticed, but both of us noticed these two guys in the uniforms, right? The first thing that drew my eye was this little kid in the middle holding some kind of trophy. Um, so it's interesting to see if each of the kids can come to it from a different approach and different perspective and then they can start coming up with some answers or some you know uh, speculative questions like did what kind when was this taken why was it taken what was the trophy um, they don't look really happy did they get second place I don't know right um, so that's that's how I would kind of start and that's um, sometimes how uh, I like to get the kids engaged uh, particularly with images and photographs um, that's how I would start and that's my big thing with uh, with using the local history is that the kids need to ask questions and they need to be willing to ask questions that they ne might not necessarily find the answers to. Um, so for civics, uh, civics is a little bit different because it's more of a is, a, is more of a um, current events type of thing. But again, like I said before, browsing by contributor, which is right here, that allows you to go in. And a lot of these local libraries have digitized their local newspapers before they were all amalgamated under like Sun Media and stuff like that. So for example, Brantford used to have multiple different newspapers. Um, those are not digitized fully, but some other communities have digitized these early, early newspapers that you can't actually find in a Google search. So this is a really good way to um, get kids to use the database in terms of digital, digital literacy by browsing by contributor and then going through and saying, okay, newspaper. So really quickly, I'm just gonna go out and show another example of that. And then I have one more and then I'm done. So here I am uh, looking, um, I think it was Thessalon Union Public Library. So we can see here, we have photographs, clippings. Right, so Algomer town pets, Sioux Star clipping. So even looking at how newspapers are designed differently and what kind of information do we have um, in a newspaper, you know, 70 years ago or 50 years ago versus what we have now, uh, how is people's access to information there. The image that I had up before about the election results would be interesting to use as well. And again, there's lots of uh, issues that are local that come up over and over and over again. It might be like, what are we going to do with that bridge? Or how are we going to deal with this group of people? And a lot of those times those issues are recurring 
constantly throughout a local history uh, and this could be one way that you would do that is using the, the newspaper clippings from different times time periods and then lastly um, this is the this is the course I was talking about before and this is really interesting and this is a grade 11 course it's open um, and again I don't think a lot of schools are offering it or if they do it's very very specific but this is a great uh, grade 11 course where we talk it's basically the whole focus is local history and the whole idea is that students are going to investigate um, a specific group an ethnic group in their community or in Canada. And it focuses on the history of people who came to Canada from a specific country. And the whole um, nota bene at the bottom is as the course is to be developed and delivered with a focus to be determined by the school. So it's up to the individual schools because each individual community has different um, immigrant groups. And the one that's local to me that I think is really interesting, even though I'm not even close to that is in Waterloo. We have, I found this article or this picture on the images uh, for the our Ontario and I went through and it, you can see here it's Russian Mennonites in 1924 um, at the Herb Street Mennonite Church so again you could do the questioning uh, activity so who in this photograph are the immigrants right is it the people on the left is it the people on the right and then the kids would be like well that person's carrying a suitcase right and um, what are we noticing about the immigrant group here versus this group and it's at, they said, Herb Street Mennonite Church. So now we have churches that are devoted to specific groups. So again, you're collecting primary source evidence, but this is interesting too, is uh, religious and spiritual beliefs and practices. So um, Russian Mennonites, of course, um, being Mennonites have specific religious practices. So then the kids could explore that a little bit more. And then the role of community support groups. A lot of immigrant groups that came over in Canada's 20th century history anyways, did it as maybe refugees. And a lot of those churches were supporting people and coming over. And that creates these little pockets or smaller communities within uh, larger communities. And it's funny too, like my own family, Bruce Mines, Sault Ste. Marie, coming out of Detroit, Ingersoll, um, but then they all end up somewhere, right? Um, so you can talk here about um, church and religious refugee sponsorship. So then I did a little bit more digging and then what I found was in fact there's a Mennonite archive of Ontario and they have a whole uh, oral history project where you can actually look at transcripts and you can also uh, look at the um, biographies of some of these people. So that's my last screen that I'm going to share and then I will stop talking because I tend to share a lot. So I just want to, so here it is right here. So they have these cassette tapes. Uh, some of the interview summaries are here and because you might not be able to access those, but the biographical summaries are pretty interesting and they're all in PDF form. And if you scroll down, uh, they're all on, um, on tape, but these transcripts have been downloaded as PDF files, right? So this would be an opportunity for kids to explore the use of oral history and maybe come up with their own way of, you know, asking people within their communities, how does an oral history project work? And can you look at that? Uh, you contact those people. Um, and then they can go through and look at that. Now this is for grade 11. So it's gonna be a little bit more detail rich. Um, and again, the 1920s. So there's that image that we found. And now we use that image to springboard off into a, a story um, that can connect kids with their communities, right? Um, so it's the Russian Mennonite immigrants of the 1920s. So there's that image that we saw. Uh, and then, you know, it wouldn't it be interesting if we could actually connect that image to maybe one of these biographies, which I have no idea if it does or not. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Basically, um, I just find that kids become very engaged when they can identify local buildings, local people, local street names. And they do, I think, engage when they can, there's a sense of community pride that comes with that, that they're not just sort of plunked down into this place that has no context. And then when we talk about things like conscription or World War I or the Great Depression or the immigrant experience, you take that grand narrative and you can give them something that they can tangibly hold on to and perhaps even see in their communities or maybe they might recognize some names um, and I think that's a really great way, way to engage kids um, with their local community and also with the history. So that is
my presentation. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, we were going to uh, break out into some breakout rooms to sort of share some of our own ideas, but I think um, it's 10 to five. So we'll uh, ask Daniel to join us. So, Hi, um, everyone. <laughs> and I will share my screen and we can uh, go through your slideshow whenever you're ready, Daniel. Great, fantastic. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so that was great. Uh, those are some awesome resources. Uh, I think I want to talk a little bit about what the Ontario Historical Society has to offer for teachers that might be looking to access local history in their region, or perhaps see what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of groups might be around that could help them find what they're looking for. Um, so the Ontario Historical Society, uh, just a little bit about us, we're a not-for-profit corporation, registered charity, uh, an NGO. We work with people all across the province from different backgrounds, different cultural histories, preserving some aspect of Ontario's history. Um, and the OHS has a provincial mandate. Uh, we are located in uh, Willowdale at the John McKenzie House. And we have some great, uh, some great resources to share with you. So um, I'll get to it. Um, Ness, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, I'll let you know when we can move the slides, I guess. So, uh, just really briefly, uh, we'll, I think uh, maybe we'll skip over this one just to, uh, to save some time. Um, there's lots about the OHS, and I can certainly share some resources with everyone in the webinar uh, that they can access after. Um, one thing I want to talk about really quickly before I get into it is an act to incorporate the Ontario Historical Society is sent to the 1st of April, 1899. And this act gives the OHS very unique power and responsibility to incorporate groups in their own right through the OHS. So this is something that I'm not aware of any other group, at least in North America, uh, that is able to do. So we can actually incorporate groups as not-for-profit uh, in incorporations that are working on some aspect of Ontario's history. And then they fall under our umbrella and we offer them support. Uh, we offer them guidance. We work with them on their projects. Uh, we get involved with them and they get involved with us. And it allows groups to become incorporated quickly so that they can do many different things. But most importantly, and most commonly, groups that are incorporating through the OHS need to do so in order to take um, ownership or long-term lease of a heritage asset. Um, and a lot of those assets are local sites and heritage landmarks in local communities. Um, so we have groups all across the province that are doing that, and that brings me to what the OHS might be able to offer as a resource to teachers looking for local history. So we'll go to the next slide, and just really briefly here, this is just uh, a layout of all the groups. So as you can see, um, we had, uh, I think, uh, 37 in the last uh, five years that have joined the OHS from all across the province. Um, so. Uh, We'll move to the next slide where you can see the OHS homepage. And um, from here, you can click on the Ontario Heritage Directory and map, which will come up on the slider. It's also a, that dark blue block in the middle there. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see uh, what you'll get at the homepage of the directory. You can search the directory by name. So for instance, if you're looking for a specific group or a specific area, you can start out with that keyword. For instance, here I'm searching Smith's Falls. Uh, district and Historical Society, so Smith just brings that right up. Um, and from there, we can go straight to the page for Smith's Falls. But I'm going to use another example. So we'll go to the next slide and pretend that we are looking for uh, something in a particular area. So this runs on Google Maps, so it's using the same interface and the same engine as Google Maps here. Um, you search, let's say we're starting out in the Kawartha Lakes or Peterborough region, um, and we'll go to the next slide and then you'll, you'll see us sort of zoom in on one particular area where we might be trying to find a group uh, in your local area. For instance, if you were in the, uh, the Lakefield area. So a couple of groups popped up there that we have. And, you know, we're obviously we're constantly working on getting more groups involved and adding more groups to the directory. There's hundreds in there now. And we're looking at obviously always expanding. Um, and here, if we go to Friends of Hope Mill, just as an example, uh, say that you're teaching in this area. So we go to the next slide and we'll be able to see what we've got there. So you pull up the member details and Friends of Hope Mill incorporated through the Ontario Historical Society. And we have all sorts of different assets 
and links that come up from different groups. And we're constantly evolving that, uh, looking at getting any assets that groups may be able to share put up on the directory, like walking tours of their local areas, um, publications that are, are free to access or open, open source access, um, their Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, their websites, photos, articles, things like that. Um, and those will be listed there. So for instance, Friends of Hope Mill, you can go to any of their social media from this, pro, um, uh, from this landing page. You can also get in touch with them. Uh, you know where they are. And we'll go to their website on the next slide. And that's one thing that you'll be able to pull up from the directory uh, under this particular profile. And it'll bring you to the Hope Mill website. So this uh, beautiful 19th century mill uh, is still in operation. So there's a group of wonderful people that work there. And what they do is they, they keep that mill running. They actually mill lumber. And the, it's really incredible how they've been able to keep it going. And that's one local resource where, you know, these gentlemen will be able to tell you all sorts of interesting pieces of history from that area, from how the, the river and the logging industry and the milling industry, how all of those things came together to make this very interesting story and how they saved the building and how they've been able to maintain the machinery and keep everything going and provide this really valuable resource to the community. And there are resources like that all across the province and on the directory, you'll be able to find those in your local area. And the OHS is always here to help you. And I know that many of our groups and many of our members are always looking for more involvement and they're always looking for more interest in the community. And, you know, that furthers their mission as much as it does ours. And I think it can be very helpful to teachers across the province who are looking to get their students involved with local history and bring that into their classroom. So that's just one example. And, you know, I'm, I'm always available to talk to people who might be interested in using the directory or seeing what's out there. And I know a lot of our members will be too. So keep that in mind and do reach out to me if you have any questions about that. And I'm happy to, to get in touch with anybody. So uh, I think that's it, Vanessa. I think we have a few just contact details that'll be there in the slide. And that's it for me. So please reach out. I'm happy to help anytime. Yeah, that was great. Um, I look forward to using all of this new uh, material. Um, it's 459. So again, um, we had so much great information today. I don't think that we'll um, have our breakout rooms. But I will be sending out an email uh, with links and a copy of the um, slideshow um, that was presented today. Uh, thank you again, Daniel and Megan. And thank you, uh, everyone, for coming today. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering if any of the participants have any questions, like if you wanted to stick around, yes. like would, would they be able to? to answer yes. any questions. <laughs> so if everyone, if you had questions for Megan or Daniel. I just, I just wanted to add something if I could. Can yes. I add something? All right. Um, Go ahead. Oh, crap. Okay. So the other thing, too, is a lot of um, local historians and archivists and curators and um, people in the in the local libraries, they really want to make these connections, but they're not like it, it's not really up to them to do the outreach as much as it is, as it is us as teachers to reach out. So there's like this weird disconnect. And I think it's important that when we approach these partners that we have a specific goal in mind, like what do we want the kids to actually do with this stuff and, and what is it you want the kids to learn because simply bringing them and saying okay they're doing a project on when a World War One and the Great Depression maybe make it more specific so that they can actually um, help you with that. Um, because we're the curriculum experts we kind of have to break it down so that they 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 know how to help us and i and i found that in having these conversations with the actual 
um, local partners that the more dialogue, the better. And then you can actually develop programming, which uh, has been done extensively in a lot of local areas like Haldeman County and Brantford and stuff like that. Thanks. That's really helpful, Megan. I think it's really important for teachers to understand how like um, how enthusiastic a lot of local history societies and, and folks that work in local history can be about reaching out to schools or about connecting with schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's helpful. Mm 